Our next presenter probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. He's uh, one of the founders of the IA Institute, who is sponsoring this great program today. Is the uh, author of the world famous worldwide uh, ar information architecture for the World Wide Web, the Polar Bear Book, which some of you probably have. And we'll be giving this copy away in a little while. So stick around for that. And uh, he's also more recently uh, working uh, with his own media company, Rosenfeld Media, and sponsoring the uh, Enterprise UX Conference, which is a terrific program really dedicated to uh, uh, moving user experience past uh, consumer products and really trying to uh, tackle problems within enterprises. Since uh, more of us use enterprise software uh, constantly every day, we should have the same experiences that we do when we're on our consumer products. So without much more delay, please welcome to the stage, Lou Rosenfeld. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm on? OK. Good? OK, good, good. That's better. Uh, most important thing that um, I want to make sure I do during my talk, and I will forget to do it at the end, so I need to do it now, and you need to help me is to honor the people who put together this event, as well as this event in, what is it, 57 other cities today? Amazing. So uh, I want to especially thank Coco and Sean and Anthony, a lot of other volunteers uh, whose names I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, gotten yet, but uh, I appreciate everyone who's doing something today. And also uh, to the Bloomberg folks uh, for this beautiful, this is just like an incredible space. I wish I could rent it for my own conference. Um, and uh, um, I think I had something like uh, 10 uh, hours of, of labor put into getting this presentation to work. I hope it doesn't disappoint. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about um, really kind of getting past user research. I'm actually going to somehow tie this back into IA hopefully by the time the talk is done. Some of you have seen me give a version of this presentation at some point. I've been doing it for a few years, and I felt like when I started doing it, um, it was sort of like, eh, yeah, yeah, whatever, Lou. Um, keep going on about that. Eventually, uh, it might make sense. And uh, now I'm finding a lot of people are starting to say, would you give that talk again? Because we're starting to get to this point where we've gotten a pretty good foundation of user research in our organizations, and now we're at the point where we need to think about what is next. Uh, and those of you for, uh, who are hearing this for the first time, uh, hopefully it resonates with you as well. Um, I'm going to start uh, with a, um, a video, which we're actually going to have to switch over to a, a different monitor. Are we switched? Good. Now, it's a bit wistful for me to put this video up. I'm going back to the old days in November 2013. Remember those days? <laughs> With breaking news around uh, a certain website launch. Let's see if this works. Example of this, by the way, just to use an analogy. Um, when we came into office, we heard a lot of complaints about the financial aid forms that families have to fill out to get federal financial aid. Uh, and I actually remember applying for some of that stuff and remember how difficult and confusing it was. And Arnie Duncan over at Education worked with a team to see what we could do to simplify it and it made a big difference. Uh, and that's part of the process that we've got to go through. And in fact, uh, you know, if we can get some focus groups and, and we sit focus down groups. with actual users and hey. see you know, how, how well is this working? What would improve it? What, what part of it didn't you understand? That, that all, I think, uh, is part of the, uh, what we're going to be working on uh, in the weeks ahead. Did you hear what he said? Once upon a time in the United States, we had a user researcher in chief. <laughs> Once upon a time. And uh, you can switch back to the other deck. Um, amazing the largest bureaucracy in, on the planet, and here's our stuff being discussed about, even sort of using our language, although I wasn't so happy about the focus group part. <laughs> um, if I can get, uh, okay, here we go. This is my version without the audio. Let me switch here. So listen, this is kind of 
big because some of us, especially those of us who've been in the field for a really, 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 really long time, have been trying to get decision makers like that guy to listen to us for so long about the value of understanding users, understanding customers, of doing some kind of research. And that's fantastic that finally we, we won, right? We did it. We brought down the government, in a sense. All right. Well, you know, now um, that we've got that victory under our belts, well, did we win the war? I'm not so sure. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience when I used to do consulting in the not so distant past. When I would ask about user research, I'd go to a large company and say, what are you guys doing? What, what kind of research are you? So what, is it, what does victory look like at large organizations that are now spending money on user research? And I wonder if this will resonate with some of you. Ask yourselves, what kind of user research are we doing where I work? Well, this is a kind of a typical situation for me when I would do uh, my own uh, exploration of what research was happening. And so I always used to do things like, um, hey, you know, is there a, some kind of user research group or team? And, and what are they doing? What are they producing? Uh, are there any kind of studies that I could take a look at? Um, but I would also ask for other things, like my favorite toy for many years was looking at search logs from uh, site search. And so I would ask for that type of information. And sometimes the people I'd started with were user, usually user research teams would kind of look at me and, well, you know, we don't really think about that stuff much. That's sort of kind of somebody else's table. So um, OK, well, uh, do you have any other kind of information? Do you guys have call centers? And if so, do they capture the information coming in to that type of service uh, 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 connection with customers? And um, in many cases, uh, that wasn't so obvious to the people inside the company either. So I remember working with one company uh, where it took something like nine months for us to track down this type of information from a call center, ultimately, that was found in Omaha. So um, another kind of information that I used to ask about was you know, basic analytics stuff. It's not always so easy to find the analytics in an organization, because that's usually somebody else's stuff. And they're not necessarily giving it away or making it available. And then uh, I, I, I used to stumble on other things I hadn't necessarily known even existed when I started off in this field, like voice of the customer research, which was often owned by another group or team that came from a totally different background than I might have been familiar with. And on and on. Uh, CRM applications throw off a lot of interesting information that can have a, a research value. Who has that stuff? How do we get to that stuff? It's not always so obvious. You may have a People doing uh, NPS work, maybe they come from another silo inside the organization. You might want to see that. You might not get your hands on that. Uh, there may be a research uh, uh, center at the organization. They're doing interesting work. They're understanding customers and users in very new ways. But that information doesn't always make it to other people in the organization. I remember working with one organization where I was so happy uh, to find a mental model diagram on the wall in one of the uh, war rooms. And I'd been, uh, I was really happy, i got to tell you, because I published the book, Mental Models, around this time. But, uh, uh, but um, I was kind of sad, too, because I'd been working with this client for about five or six months, and they, never, they neglected to tell me they even did this kind of work. It would have been really useful for me, and actually for other people on their team that cared about user research. Um, I found in another organization something I'd never heard of called brand architecture research, which had its own methods and was done by a different group of people. You know, all these different ways of understanding users by different kinds of people with different tools, with different brains. Yet you know, we got a problem. What's going on here? What? Think about, think about what I just ran through. Your organization may do some of those. It may do all of those. It may do even more. It is spending lots of money on talented, expensive people and tools and accumulating tons of data. And yet, this is still the problem. We still don't have this, the kind of quality design that we think we should have at this point. So we may have won the battle. We may have established some form or another of user research inside of organizations. 
and yet we're, we've got so long to, uh, so far to go. Uh, it's been a long way, but it's not far enough. So uh, what I want to talk about first is this fable. You may be familiar with it. It's the fable of the blind men and the elephant. So we have a lot of blind men right now, um, uh, people like uh, the standard HCI user researchers who are, you know, maybe they're kind of walking around in the jungle and they, uh, well, let me tell you the fable. The fable is you have a bunch of people walking around the jungle that happen to be blind. I don't know what they're doing out there by themselves, unaccompanied by someone who has vision. Uh, and um, one of them touches the trunk of the elephant and says, I think I found a snake. Another one touches the leg of the elephant and says, no, 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 this is uh, clearly a tree, and so on and so forth. Not one of them has the full picture. They don't have the total truth. They just have a little piece. And each of that little piece is not that useful on its own. But when they put it together, that's when it really has value. And so each of these different competencies of user research is kind of like a blind man. So if you're an HCI user research type of person, you have one little piece of the truth. If you're an analytics person, you have another little piece of the truth, and so on and so forth. I want to delve a little bit into how these different perspectives start to come together. So let me first start with this one. The idea that many of us who care about users or care about customers and are trying to get inside their heads and understand their behaviors, their wants, their needs, their habits, some of us are really good at figuring out what is going on. We understand the what aspect. We understand, let's say, the behavior that customers uh, uh, exhibit. Others of us are really good at understanding why they do the things they do. So you might say uh, an analytics person is really good at establishing behavior, but they're not necessarily good at digging deeper beyond the behavior, like, let, like let's say someone who's really good at user interviewing might do. They might be better at the why aspect. There's a lot of other dichotomies to explore like this. I always like this one, the quant versus the qual. The quant is some person who, um, you know, somewhere buried in their brain is ham radio skills while the uh, qual person has a fear of numbers but the ability to match shirt with shoes. So, you know, it's a stereotype, but there is some truth to the stereotype. These are brains that work very differently. And anyone who's doing any kind of research, you know, you're going to have some of them that have a quant perspective and some that have a qual perspective. It's not one of those that's right or wrong. They're both interesting. They're both different blind men. They both paint a picture of the truth. Um, some of us are really focused on organizational goals. Others of us are really kind of focused on the user. And sometimes that's a difficult thing to balance. It's a good fight to, to have, but they're both important. Uh, I, I think people are focused, let's say, on KPI or thinking about what the organization wants. And sometimes those KPI leave out what's important to customers or users and, and vice versa. So interesting, because I bet you if we looked at the room here, we have some of you who are more organizationally focused, and some of you are more focused on customers. Some of us are really good at really measuring the world that we do know. So let's say you're an analytics person, and you're focused on uh, creating really strong reports that show how well a product or a service is behaving and performing. That's fantastic. But this, different people could look at that analytics data and find things that were unexpected. They might go at that data in a very different way. They might go at it in a more exploratory way and learn things that aren't anticipated by our reports. They might see new patterns. And that's a different kind of brain that does that. It may not be as good at the precision of measurement, but it might be really good at pattern matching, or at least establishing new patterns, even though they're working with the same kind of data. Some of us are really comfortable with statistical data. We like facts and figures. Some of us are more comfortable with richer semantic data. We like ideas. That's more our thing. We might look at the same kinds of information and start gravitating to the statistical side or the, or the more descriptive side. It's all good, but it's all inside our organizations right now. And this is kind of the problem. I, I think we still have a behavior 
that's built in as human beings of wanting to congregate with people like us. And we see ourselves as different than that group over there that might be doing analytics and that group over there that might be doing brand architecture and so on and so forth. And the problem is we set up these false dichotomies whereas really things are true and other things are true. And the challenge is to put those truths together in new ways that lead to actual insight. And I think and submit that a lot of organizations that are spending heavily on user research have not achieved that insight because they haven't started to combine these separate areas into ways that are meaningful. So uh, I'm going to sum these up real briefly in my table of overgeneralized dichotomies. So think about, I'm just picking on, let's say, two areas that should be familiar to you, uh, web analytics and, and user experience. Think about what they're analyzing. Web analytics people looking at user behaviors versus on the, on the UX side, we're often looking at intentions and motives. So what versus why. Uh, what kind of methods we use. On the analytics side, we're definitely more typically using uh, quant methods to understand the what. On the UX side, more, we more tend to be focused on qual methods that uh, are, are good at answering why. Uh, what we're trying to achieve. A lot of analytics people are really there to understand ways to make the organization perform better. Again, this is overgeneralizing. Uh, on the UX side, we're, we tend to be more advocates for users. Uh, how we use data, we're often, on the analytics side, measuring performance. It's very goal-driven versus on uh, the UX side, we tend to be a little bit more comfortable looking for patterns and surprises. And then finally, what kind of data? Well, on the uh, analytics side, more typically stat statistical data, descriptive data on the UX side. So you look at these things side by side, and I, I think what we start to see is how these might fit. So if you are trying, if you're one of these people who's trying to understand one of these people, or vice versa, you kind of see how your work might come together more effectively. And that's what I'd like to see as the next step to get beyond user research is to start taking these various teams and groups and tribes, practices, sets of methods and approaches, of which we only have two reflected here, but more of those to put them together in ways that they stop being individual blind men and start seeing the elephant together, start really understanding the truth of how people experience their products and services, and to start arriving at true insights that can really take those products and services forward. So I want to explore four themes that I think can help get us there and tell you a few stories along the way. Four themes, balance, cadence, conversation, and perspective. All right, let's start with balance. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of data, tiny bit of data. This is actually a little a snippet of search log analysis we're going to do together. So let me walk you through what's happening here. First blob is one search coming from one IP address at uh, 1025 in the morning. And someone searched on Linson's plate. They got zero results. Same IP address two seconds later or so, they searched on license plate. And they got 146 results. Every one of you is looking at this tiny snippet of data and drawing a conclusion. But those conclusions are probably quite diverse. So just in this room with a lot of IA people, um, I, I can promise you there are probably at least 10 reasonable uh, explanations of what happened here and what its significance might be. So for example, if you're a web analytics person, you're looking at this and you might be saying, hmm, so someone is searching for license plates. Maybe this is a, a, a like DMV site or something. Um, are they actually uh, renewing their plate? Are they being successful? Are we converting it? And uh, a user researcher might look at it and say, huh, this is an interesting search. Is it a common search? How well is this performing overall? Maybe I'm not so concerned just about the conversion, but how this one stacks up against other searches. What's the most common? 
Uh, are there synonyms that we should be taking into account? Can we do some clustering? So you might look at it differently based on whether you're an analytics person, based on uh, whether you're a user researcher, also all those other dichotomies that I put up earlier. And that's one tiny snippet of information. So when we look at our data, it would be useful probably to have different kinds of brains looking at the same data, right? Because you're going to get some different conclusions. Instead of having essentially the, the tyranny of one researcher who looks at their own data and only has one set of conclusions that they're ever likely to arrive at. OK. Let's take a balanced approach not only with how we look at individual blobs of data, but what kind of tools uh, we use. And I'm sorry, that should be not meth. <laughs> but it got cut off. It's, can you guess it's methodology? Methods, actually. Uh, here we go. So what would it mean to have balance with meth, anyway? You're all laughing very knowingly. I'm kind of worried here. Anyway, uh, balance with meth. Uh, here's a, here's a, um, a very typical um, persona, pretty standard. Nice little persona. Now, you may all be comfortable with a persona, even though it's a fiction. Other people might not be. How might you make this more real for some of those other people? How might they make it more real is really a better question. Well, um, perhaps we, here we go, there's methods. Perhaps we add in some kind of idea of how this persona would behave from a quantitative view. Now, suddenly, you have a method that might be far more robust. So it's good for you as well as good for the people that you're working with. It's a way to come together. And you know, this, is, this is basically an, an example of looking at methods individually with different brains. In other words, trying to bring balance to how we look at and utilize individual methods. Now this is an ugly slide. It's like the ugliest slide in the world. And I think it's the, the, one of the greatest slides I've ever seen. I didn't make it. A guy named Christian Rohrer made it. And it's called the Landscape of User Research Methods. It's fantastic. In fact, let me, uh, let me make it a little bigger. What he's done here is he's taken um, a, a large collection of user research tools and methods. And he's put them together in one chart. It's a, it's a two by two, where on, on this axis, as you can see, he's got behavioral methods on, on that end and attitudinal on this end, qualitative on this end of this spectrum, and quant on that end. And so he's mapped them out into four quadrants. That's a very balanced approach to understanding research methods. And you might want to think about using something like this as a way to inventory your own organization's research methodology. And you might find that uh, you have a, like a big cluster of your approaches up in that upper right-hand corner. And you might say, well, that's not surprising given the kind of people we have working here. We're, we're very quant-driven and behaviorally driven. OK, that's fine. But how are we going to achieve balance by covering the other three quadrants? So having a balanced methodology is pretty critical because, again, these are the actual blind men. If you only have one type of blind man, you're not really getting anywhere near the truth. So Christian Rohr did a great job there. Um, you can uh, Google uh, landscape of user research methods, and it'll come right up. And maybe you can pretty it up for him and send it to him. He'd be, be a bit more effective if a different, more graphical brain took a pass at this. All right. So balance, I think, actually goes together quite nicely with what I would call cadence. Um, it's not just what you're doing, but it's when you're doing it. So here's an example of a research cadence that Whitney Quisenberry uh, came up with that looks at doing certain methods, like in this case, uh, a customer service log review, uh, site, insert, uh, a site search log analysis, et cetera, et cetera, field studies, uh, and looks at them over time. So certain things, as you can see, like the uh, log review, are done repeatedly, and they don't take much time. Something like a field study, not so frequently, takes a lot of time. Certain things kind of are, are faster, repeat them more often. Other things, not so much. 
you can actually see it visually and get a sense of how balanced over time, what kind of cadence over time are we using to understand our users? And um, if you only had choppy stuff, that might not be so good. Because the choppy stuff is great in the sense that you're, you have an ongoing view, but you're not getting deep and, really going, and you're not really going deep into what people really want. And the converse would be true as well. So the idea of having a cadence for constantly understanding users, but in different, different ways, frequent and, and light, uh, less frequent and deep, is pretty good. And what's nice is you can actually start mapping out almost a, a, a schedule uh, of what you do weekly versus quarterly versus annually, or whatever the cadence might be, and then combine that with balance, what we were talking about a little earlier. So you might say, for the really choppy weekly stuff, I want to make sure I'm covering you know, at least qual and quant to some degree. I'm probably going to be constrained just to the behavioral analysis, because I don't really have time on a weekly basis to go much deeper. Maybe that's not true. Maybe I could uh, find two users to talk to in depth every week. And that's a way I could kind of rebalance this. So I see I just fixed it. Um, so you could get uh, more of an attitudinal aspect into your weekly analysis. Uh, here in, in, the, in the quarterly, we're talking about having a bit of a mix of behavioral, attitudinal. Oh, and there we have qualitative and quantitative. Annual, same sort of thing. So if you can combine the array of methods that you're using and time them in a way uh, that really works well to get at both breadth and depth, now you've got kind of a really robust plan for getting those different brains together and looking at reality and drawing some really interesting uh, conclusions and hopefully insights from it. Third thing, the concept of conversation is very um, obvious and yet very underplayed, underemphasized. Part of the, what I mean by conversation is just that when you're talking about all these different people, these different brains that come from different backgrounds and use different tools, they also use very different vocabularies. You ever try to talk with someone very different with you in the work context? It can be really a struggle. And in fact, half the battle in many cases is just having a conversation that you both can participate in, you can both understand, you can meet each other halfway when you don't quite understand each other and work together to get through those differences of, of language. In fact, um, the, the polar bear book is probably successful because A, we timed it well, but B, it was the real thing there was just to get people from different backgrounds with different languages to talk together using the same vocabulary and concepts about information problems. Well, we're kind of trying to do the same thing with research here. How do we get good conversations to happen? Well, it starts with language. One way you might do it is to think of developing a pidgin, a kind of language that is, is not its own language, but it's at least shared vocabulary that works for people who speak different languages. And the way you do that is by finding out what you have in common as concepts. So uh, Dave Gray uh, turned me on to this. They're called boundary objects. They are things that live at the intersection of separate fields and that are similar enough that people from either field get it when they talk to each other about it. So something like KPI and goals. You might call them KPI. She might call them goals. They're pretty similar. They may not be exactly the same. But the fact is you can look at them together. And because you understand them together, you can actually work on them together. The same thing might true with, be true with things like personas and um, market segments. They're not exactly the same, but reson they resonate well with the, the, the fields that they come from and for, the, for each other. Um, so there are probably a number of concepts that you already kind of take for granted. And if you look at another field, you're going to see something that's close. And hopefully, you can get someone from that other field to do the same for your field and start pulling together a, a consistent, a useful shared set of vocabulary. Um, Dave actually took this concept out a bit further into something called boundary matrices, where you're actually taking 
um, all the different uh, concepts from those two, in this case, two disciplines and mapping them together. Uh, I have a link for it. Um, the slide, this uh, presentation is up in SlideShare, so all the links will be live from there. So if you want to know a little bit more about it, um, Dave's work is really great for that. Um, another way to, get, to have better conversations across uh, disciplines is to ban words. And like, I'm a librarian by training. I can't believe I'm saying to ban anything involving language. But the truth of the matter is we, um, we have really crappy conversations because we use words that uh, have no meaning, that are long ago stopped having any useful meaning. And we take them for granted. Like those of you who uh, have been around long enough, you remember the word portal? Was that a useful term when you were talking with a client? Or a, a stakeholder, or, any, or a, even a colleague? What do you mean by portal? Uh, it's a portal. It's a, it, 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 don't, don't argue with me, it's a portal. No, but, 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 no. You gotta actually ban words like that, or try not to use them. And uh, if you can actually get past words like portal, well, now you can actually talk about problems and get to going through the process of diagnosing those problems. There's a lot of words like that that are crufty, that mask really what's going on. Because people struggle. We, we, you know, we know there's a problem, but we often haven't gone through the work of doing the diagnostics to figure out what's really wrong. Because it kind of exposes the fact that we know there's a problem, but we don't know much more about it. And that's a difficult feeling for a professional. The truth of the matter is you can't really do the diagnostics by yourself for, most, for the most part when it's an important big problem. You have to find people with other kinds of brains. So how do we get those people to work together on doing those diagnostics? I think it's by being very careful, if not banning, avoiding using terms that we take for granted to the, uh, to the point that we don't even really know what they mean anymore. So I, I'm, very, um, I'm a very big fan of avoiding the use of product names. Like you don't refer to your analytics team by whatever the, the product it is that they use uh, every day. Um, don't see yourself as a certain kind of person associated with a particular method that kind of labels you in a really unuseful way. Same thing with departments, disciplines, outcomes. None of these things really talk about problems. And so none of these things really can help you get to solutions. Another uh, approach to having better conversations is to actually tell stories. And I know we talk a lot about stories in our field, but um, I mean, the truth of the matter is, as overplayed as it can be, people get stories. We're trained to understand stories from uh, our earliest time. We're interacting with our parents, and, and they're, they're teaching us through the stories. Uh, it's a very human thing. It's one of the things that actually makes us human. And um, one of the stories I always like, actually, I think Jared Spool told me this one. Uh, it's one that involves different kinds of brains using different kinds of methods and different kinds of data. So Jared talks about the Land's End team um, looking at their, um, their search logs and finding, they, first of all, they were looking for the searches that had zero results, the most common ones. And they found tons of searches that had SKU numbers, you know, the product ID numbers. Wait a minute. People are searching our site for our product numbers, which are not on our site, incidentally. And they're getting zero results using our own product numbers. Well, good thing they looked, right? It's an easy thing to fix. You make the SKU numbers actually retrieve the product the person is looking for. But then they were wondering, well, how on earth do people know that we have SKU numbers, much less how, how do, where do they find them? Well, that's when the analytics people handed it off to the ethnographers. The ethnographers did a field study. They went into the homes of customers, and they found that you know, those catalogs that have been coming in the mail for a million years, you see them every couple months, you know how to use them. They're high res, uh, the images are really great, they're easy to use. People would rather, and back in this time at least, look through the printed catalogs, find the thing they were looking for, and then rather than do what they used to do, which is call the 800 number and deal with a human, which is a really horrible experience for most introverts at least, um, they would go to the website and type in the SKU number. So that is really cool when you can take what an analytics person learned, the what, fix the problem, but then let's dig a little deeper and get the ethnographer involved in the why and understand our, our users even better. 
That's a great story of how these different brains work together. You have stories that you can tell like that right now, or that you wish you could tell, if only you could make it happen. So you can almost do predictive storytelling. Think about what would be nice if you were working with someone different than you. What might happen? And how might you put your ability together with theirs? Um, here's another story. It involves generosity and patience and persistence. It's, um, someone you, not, some of you may know Samantha Starmer, who now is at Ralph Lauren here in New York, but uh, years ago was at REI. And she was running a small user research team. And she knew that somewhere on the REI campus were people doing market research that would be really interesting for her to know about. And she decided to um, go to the other building where the market researchers were and um, with a bunch of bags of M&Ms and knock on doors and see if people would talk to her, people she didn't know, market researchers, who might have market research data that would be really useful. Uh, and so she, she basically was a, came with a smile and candy and tried to get to know people. And if they weren't around, she might leave them a note with a little bag of candy. Uh, eventually, she met enough people that they started getting together for lunch. Those lunches started to grow. Uh, other people with different kinds of user research or customer research started joining them. Uh, those lunches became brown bags. They were starting to present for each other. That brown bag series became a community of practice at REI. And ultimately, they ended up as one group. One group of people, different backgrounds, different methods, different types of data, all under one roof. So it took a few years. It took some persistence. But she was able to do it. Um, I think one of the things that we often forget in a field where we jump around from jobs so quickly where we're often uh, very impatient, and many times for good reason, is that it does take time to change organizations and to change cultures. And I give Samantha a lot of credit for doing that. Think about what kind of conversations you can have over time, like she did. Fourth theme I want to explore is this one I would call perspective. How you look at the landscape or environment of user research in your organization. If you can look at it, in one sort of single view, you can understand it and make sense of it in a way that you might not be able to now. So in effect, we're talking about how you might map user research in your organization. Um, let me show you an example of a map. You've seen it already. It's the landscape of user research methods that Christian Rohr came up with. Now, your version of this might look a little different. It, invariably, it will. You may not have all these things. There may be other things that he doesn't have because this is reflecting his bias of user research. But it is a map, and it is useful. You can use this now to understand where your gaps are. You can not only understand where in your organization research is happening with a map like this, but you can start thinking about um, you know, how you staff your team. Is your team balanced? Is your training of your team balance and so forth. So maps are really useful. Here's a, another version of a map, or at least a visual diagram, that Avanesh Kaushik, who is one of the gurus of web analytics, came up with some years ago. Uh, and he is trying to present a view of like, the totality of analytics research that, that he kno knows about. That's pretty interesting. And yet it's still, like Christians, an imperfect view of reality. He said to me, look, I, I've got a bucket for the voice of the customer, but in hindsight, I should have worked harder to, to get the full qual and quant picture. So he's acknowledging that this is an incomplete map. Now, what if I got, or you got, the, the analytics people like Avanish together with the user research uh, folks like Christian together in one room? had him sit down and try to make a combined map of reality when it comes to research. I actually tried to do it with the two of them, and I couldn't quite get them together. Logistically, it didn't work. But I think there's something that can happen at an organizational level where you try to maybe map it yourself, get peers or uh, counterparts at other organizations, parts of the organization that do different kinds of research, to also paint their picture of research reality. And then maybe you can put them together. 
You might find some interesting boundary objects there while you're in the process. So mapping is a, a nice way to understand the reality and make sense of it when it comes to user research broadly uh, throughout an organization. Another idea is containers. Another way we get perspective on reality is we put things together, not just visually, but in, in a functional way, inside something that we can then use. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, MailChimp was, for many years, I thought, like the most forward-looking firm in terms of doing this. It was, it was um, the team run by Aaron Walter and then Greg Bernstein. And what they were doing was really interesting. They had a whole bunch of different types of user, user research coming together, and they felt like they couldn't really manage it, and they were losing opportunities to understand reality better because these things were very disparate. So what they did was they took all their, their inputs, all their data, all the reports, and tossed them into Evernote. It's pretty interesting. Uh, Evernote was a, a, not a bad container because you could m email stuff. Uh, it automatically got indexed, even things that were PDFs or bitmaps. And um, suddenly, people were doing searches for their own stuff, their own data, their own research, and finding research that other people had created. So if nothing else, they were finding that they had counterparts that have, had shared interests. That's pretty cool. And when you have a counterpart who shares an interest, that's an opportunity to, to look them up and have lunch, bring them candy, whatever it might be. At least have some kind of conversation. You might say that MailChimp was really on the threshold of synthesis, putting things together, kind of allowing them to stew together so that the sum ultimately was greater than the parts. Um, but you know, you probably might guess that Evernote, if you're familiar with it, is a very cool tool, but it's still a pretty basic tool. It puts things together, but those things don't really have much consistency. So I'm not sure they kind of, they really made it with MailChimp, or uh, with uh, Evernote to the point they wanted to. In fact, when I talked to them a few years later, they said, you know, it was good, but we pretty quickly realized it wasn't enough. And we've been kind of flailing around ever since, trying to figure out how we take the next step in terms of bringing our research together and getting something more out of it. So um, I've been talking to a lot of companies that are looking at doing just this. Some of them are making some interesting progress. Uh, Intuit, NASDAQ um, come to mind. Uh, there's also some tools like um, uh, Optimal Workshop has, a, what's it called? Is it Reframer? Is that what it's still called? Yeah. Uh, I, I've also seen similar tools to Reframer coming from totally different fields, like market research. There's a company doing something very different. There's an agency that's really a graphic design agency that's kind of doing the same thing. They use totally different language for describing what these tools do, but they're really kind of doing the same thing. The company that I've seen do um, the most interesting stuff, which is just a few blocks from here, is WeWork. And they have a system called Polaris that they're creating to pull together user research in what I think is a really innovative way, and what I think is kind of where we're headed uh, when we are, take synthesis seriously. Now, they have a blank slate to start with. So um, Tomer Sharon, who's actually one of my authors, is building an organization from scratch to do user research uh, at scale at WeWork. And he already is going into the challenge knowing that they're facing, uh, they're going to face, and certainly other organizations face struggles around the research being siloed, um, that people don't remember their own research, much less other people's research. So you might have done research six months ago. You don't necessarily remember it anymore because you've moved on, or you don't remember where it is. <coughs> and then finally, uh, one of the big problems that we see with a lot of user research is it's, it lives inside a report. Report is not necessarily what we need. Report kind of constrains the actual evidence that you've acquired because it's designed for one specific purpose. So let me show you what they did. This is actually an older version. They've, actually, they've, they've done some changes, 
prettied it up a little bit recently, but let me start with the, the source data. The, they store it in Airtable, which is, uh, if I understand it, it's a cloud-based uh, shotgun marriage of Excel and, and Access. That's close. <laughs> a database and a, and a spreadsheet in the cloud. That's not really important. What's important is that they have, first of all, um, a training program to train one person who works as a community manager in each of the WeWork co-working locations, of which I think they're now 130 or so globally, to acquire research through interviewing and doing videos of interviews and doing surveys and so forth. And they are putting that all together in Airtable, uh, where each little piece of knowledge gleaned from the research process is not a report, but it's called a nugget. It's a really micro level piece of, of knowledge that they've acquired. And they um, then take a ton of metadata and go crazy with it. So, so every little nugget has something like 15 different potential tags applied to it, ranging from uh, was it a negative or a positive experience, really basic things like that, to where in the user journey does it fit? And is it, does it a, uh, is it a prop? Is it a thing that they do? Uh, is it like a, is it a, a thing that you care about as a customer of WeWork, like the coffee or the, how the bathroom functions or whatever it might be? So they have tons of nuggets and tons of metadata. And when you get to this level of uh, working with your data and making it accessible, you can now apply all that metadata's filters. So uh, in this case, they looked at um, a number of filters that help them understand things about the community team. And they put them together and came up with an overall insight about how well the community team is, is doing. In this case, it's a positive one. Members recognize when the community team goes above and beyond, uh, it's, it's of medium importance, magnitude, They've done this study once, and it's based on 30, 73 observations, or nuggets. And here's all the metadata that they're dr drawing from to reach that conclusion. And then the beauty of it is the same interface provides those nuggets. The actual, in this case, video, it could be audio, it could be survey results, right there in the interface. So not only can you see data that you're maybe familiar with, maybe you produce, you could see other researchers work. You could also put this in front of a stakeholder and say, look, we've got this insight based on different types of research. And that research um, is right here. You can, you can play it. You can, you can watch it. You can listen to it. It's right here. Maybe you might draw a different conclusion. But here's all the metadata that we've come up with based on our very, very detailed analysis of what's going on. So, this is kind of interesting, because if you're looking at this, um, well, what does this say to you? Is there, what's going on with metadata and this kind of content chunking at the nugget level? I would su su uh, suggest to you that you know, WeWork's approach is, all right, we're chopping stuff up into little bits. We're applying tons of metadata. We really care about findability as a way to deal with their organizational memory. And by the way, they have a human being who is dedicated to curating this stuff. Her name is Michelle Merritt. Some of you know her. Um, I would say that this is very much an IA approach. Yeah? Is this IA? I think so. This is IA. This is IA in a different context. And I know earlier in the day, some of the other presenters talked about doing IA in a different context. But you're developing. Uh, the information architecture of a design organization, like uh, Aaron was talking about, or a research infrastructure to be reused by lots of people around an organization, it's IA. It doesn't work if it's not an IA approach. So I find that really exciting. And now I'm going to try to spend a couple minutes on how IA fits into all this stuff. I think we're kind of at a point where everything I've talked about, first of all, I would call a form of operations. I would call it decision ops. Operations to support decision making 
of, at scale and at a very high level. Ops, that sounds like DevOps. Why are you using that term, Lou? Funny you should ask. There is a DevOps movement about, you may have heard of it. When you have development and operations coming together where you're trying to create infrastructure to help other people do development at scale, that also suggests that the same thing can happen for design, can happen for research, can happen for decision making. I think that's really what's going on right now. Design skills of every stripe, just like development, are getting democratized. It's happening. In every organization, people who don't know the words that we know, they may never have even heard of the expression user experience, are doing this work. And in the most enlightened organizations, they are training people to do this work. IBM didn't just hire 1,300 designers. They're also teaching other people throughout the organization who don't think of themselves as a designer of any stripe to do the kind of work we're talking about. I want to ask you, for any of these things to work, how do they not work with information architecture? So if you are developing a pattern library, if you are, uh, or any kind of design system, if you're developing a system to manage research or subjects at scale, if you are trying to do the kind of decision support that we're talking about here and that WeWork has really been successful with, how do you do it without information architecture? I think this is maybe the most exciting place for us to work right now, building the infrastructure for organizations to make great and important decisions to improve their products and services. And we have a leg up because we're already coming out of this world of user research, we're already, or at least we're familiar with it, and we ought to be, if we're not. So I want to leave you with just a few questions. First of all, just to get beyond user research, how are you going to get your organization, however big, to make decisions that really are based on big insights. How do you get those insights? How do you get yourself to stop looking at just the report that you've seen every week for the last few years and really look at your information differently? Look at your data differently, look at other people's data, and actually work with them so that you get that compound effect. So who do you need to be talking with? Do those four themes of balance, cadence, conversation, perspective give you any kind of guidance in order to put those people, including yourself, together in new ways to get those blind men to understand each other? Are there operations that you can be building to support this at an organizational level? And uh, how does IA help? So I'll leave it with that. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk to you, even though it's the end of the day. I appreciate it. And uh, I will, um, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Do we? Brett, do we have a few minutes? I think we do, yeah. Okay, thank you. So Brett has a uh, thing, a mic, I thought you had something to throw. You can throw the mic, but that might not go over well. Um, someone in the front. Hi. Hi. Uh, I, I'm curious, how did you get in touch with WeWork, or did they get in touch with you? Or maybe talk to us about how you get in touch with these companies. How do I get in touch with companies? I'm a pain in the ass. Oh. <laughs> uh, I ask questions. I ask around. Um, uh, I have a really great network, and I think a reason I have a good network is I, I'm not afraid to admit my ignorance and be vulnerable. And when people see me cower in my ignorance, they want to help, and they usually do. That's a, and that's a very honest answer. Other question? Back there. You're not the first person today to suggest that waterfall is uh, Neanderthal. Um, and I, I understand. 
uh, you know, I've been forced to work with large organizations stuck in those old ways, but um, have used Agile to make waterfall work. Um, and I'm beginning to wonder if it might be reciprocal, that the way to get Agile to work is also to have a grand sweeping two, three, five year vision that has to have some kind of waterfall structure. Well, and it's a roadmap, so you can change your route along the way based on your sprints. I'm going to show you a picture. It's not my email. Uh, can I have a, um, thank you. Good, my email's not up there anymore. Have you ever heard of a guy named Stuart Brand? Yeah. Yeah, so he does something called the pace layering model. And this is one of my concerns with everything being a little too agile or um, uh, I think it leaves out the benefits of long-term thinking at times. So here's his model. And uh, I'll see if I can make it a little bigger. Uh, there we go. I think that's pretty big. Um, Stuart Brand talks about many aspects of the universe, but this applies in, in more micro uh, applications as well, more narrow applications, where you move from things that are immutable they don't change to things that are highly dynamic. And that this is actually true of many contexts. So uh, fashion is something that's kind of changing all the time, but the laws of physics and, and nature don't. I think that what we do in product development, product design, whatever you want to call it, um, it really kind of fits this quite well. I mean. You might have a development process that makes sense to do in an agile way, but at the other end of the scale, there are design principles and maybe brand principles as well that have to guide you. And then there's research that has to guide you as well. It's not just what we think reality is, but uh, we've actually done the research to understand our customers in a way that really has to guide us too. That might not be very, very much the core because customers needs change, but maybe it's down here somewhere. So I, I, I'm, I don't pretend to be an expert in Agile. I am uncomfortable with, with anything that purports to be the only truth. I'm uncomfortable with manifestos. Um, and I think we need manif a manifesto to not have manifestos at this point. <laughs> what I said to Stuart is that even in fashion, you have the color council planning things seven years out. So you could take a layer of this, and you could look at it through the same filter through the same model, absolutely. The point is, I think we're probably saying the same thing, is that there are things that change faster than other things, and that's okay. In fact, that's not only to be expected, but to, to be benefited from. Other questions? Am I standing between you and beer? <laughs> I get it. That's okay. us standing between it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Awesome.